with me, others. Um, today, got another great guest. He's a multiple champion. He is the current Lucha Forever champion. It's Mark Hoskins. Mark, how's it going, man? Great, man. How you doing? I'm not too bad, mate. Not too bad. Slowly uh, recovering after Friday's uh, Fight Club Pro late nightness. <laughs> right, yeah, that is a pretty mental night for like literally everyone. It seems like everyone's like hanging the next day. So uh, yeah, they know how to party. Um, right, let's dive straight into it. Um, what are your early memories of professional wrestling as a child? I remember being a kid and like not really knowing what wrestling was, but for some reason being a huge fan of Hulk Hogan. Um, and my dad helped me make a a toy wrestling ring out of an old shoebox. Really, it was turned upside down. With, like, <laughs> string for ropes and bits of wood in the corners um, and then I think I guess around sort of like the age of uh, nine um, one of my close childhood friends uh, just brought around a wrestling tape and the first match I ever watched was uh, Shawn Michaels and Undertaker and Hal in the Cell oh right okay uh, yeah 1997 so yeah that was what got me hooked and from that point on watching people beat each other up as you know <laughs> in a grueling way was uh, was my jam. So. so were you like more of a WWF, WWE fan or WCW or did you get a chance to watch any ECW as a kid? I, I think I saw a bit of ECW but it never really interested me that much whereas I was a huge WWF fan and I liked WCW just because it was wrestling and it was something different. Um, so I watched like bits and bobs of everything really um, but mainly WWF. What were the characters that um, attracted you most? I loved Shawn Michaels, um, Triple H. They were two of the first guys that I was huge fans of. Like, uh, you know, Stone Cold Steve Austin was another one. Um, and then I guess just kind of like along the years, you know, your favourites change and that. And you know, I was huge fans of guys like uh, Eddie Guerrero and Chris Jericho, who you know travelled the world, like you know, understanding how to wrestle, learning multiple different ways to wrestle, and then being able to go in there. And, do it and that's exactly what I've you know, tried to make my career to be like because I think you know, being versatile is one of the best tools that you can have. When did you decide at what age that wrestling was something that you were like, pretty away, serious like, on? Like, and, uh, yeah, like when I was nine. Really? You know I mean? Yeah, early. I was like, this is what I'm going to be and I'm going to be the world champion. Do you know what I mean? There's, I think every kid does. Yeah, and um, yeah, I told my mum and dad, I was like, I'm going to be a wrestler when I'm growing up and they were like, yeah, okay. And then here I am. <laughs> like, the phase I never grew out of and actually doing it so they were pretty supportive then oh yeah like um, my parents didn't really get to do uh, with their lives what they wanted to um, so they would they would said that once they had kids they would push them as uh, like, much as they could in the direction that they you know they wanted to go in um, and having you know parents uh, like I do like you know I'm, I'm super lucky like I couldn't have asked for better set of parents um, and they've been super supportive across the years just you know helping me chase a dream so yeah, I was really lucky, man. When did you start um, training? What age? I started training at 15. Um, yeah, there was. Uh, I was going. I started going to British wrestling shows, uh, which at that time was, I think, FWA and All Star Wrestling. Um, and just uh, I, at one of the shows, I asked if they had any information about training centres. It was a place in Portsmouth, which is about two hours from where I lived at the time. Um, so we just started going down uh, once a month, like I was still at school so we couldn't go down during the weekdays but we could go down on a Sunday which is one of the other days of uh, training was. And my dad was, uh, well, my dad's a preacher so every Sunday he would be quite uh, busy doing um, you know, sort of church related stuff. Uh, so, but he, he made it part of his thing that like one Sunday he to take off and take me down to wrestling. So that's how it, it began and it's gone downhill since then. So, <laughs> who was it that trained you originally? A guy called Mark Sloan who um, founded the original FWA and uh, you know, was the head trainer of the FWA Academy. Um, and that was weird as well because in training sessions, uh, you know, he trained Paul Birchall or guys like uh, PJ Black and that. So it was weird to have see them in you know, kind of at the start of their careers or you know early on at least and then see them go into what kind of heights they've reached you know uh, winter was another person who would regularly be at training sessions so it's been really cool and it was really uh inspiring for me as a young guy at that point like watching people i train with get picked up so yeah i think that definitely pushed me in the, the right direction can you remember your first match i can it it was a tag match i basically I, I joined part of the stable called the Chavs, um, so I was a Chav for a while, and that was fun. 
but um, <laughs> yeah, skins the chav. Skins the chav. You know what? It's funny. The amount of people that say to me like, "Why do people call you Skins?" And then like you see the light bulb go in their head just like a moment later, and they're like, "It's because your last name, isn't it?" And I'm like, "Yeah, <laughs> yeah." But um, no, that was the the nickname I got. It was pretty random. Like a friend of mine I used to go to school with. Um, gave me the nickname and then just somehow it seems to have stuck. Even to this day, people still call me Skins. So, yeah. He was your tag team partner the other day. A guy called Tom Langford. Um, he uh, gave wrestling up a few years later and went on to become a photographer. So he's um, been somebody else who's like really helped me across the years, just doing promo shots and that kind of stuff. And you know, he's living the dream what he's doing now, uh, going full time with his photography. So. Yeah, yeah, we were undefeated as a tag team as well. So, did you have more than one match? Yeah, we oh. well, we had three. I think we had three. Yeah, that so. counts then. It's a streak yeah, of sorts, it's isn't it? Some kind of streak that <laughs> didn't die, but oh well. So, um, IPW UK, that was a place that you typed quite regularly as well, wasn't it? Yeah, we did for a while, and then um, at IPW, I uh, was teamed with some. Uh, with Joel Redman, who yeah. uh, became Oliver Gray in NXT. Um, so it was cool getting to uh, team with Joel. We lived together at the time. So yeah, we were, like, we were a legitimate team, do you know what I mean? We like, ate together, we didn't sleep together. That would have sounded so weird if I said <laughs> that. But like, we lived in, like, in, out of each other's shadows, do you know what I mean? So like, it definitely added to the chemistry that we had in the ring. Um, you skip forward a few years, you got to go to Japan with Dragon Gate. Yeah. What was that like? Yeah, dude, that was super cool. Like, um, it was the furthest I'd been away from home for the longest amount of time. And being out of Japan is such a culture shock compared to what you're used to back here. Um, it was super different. It was just a uh, super cool time. Like, I got to be in the dressing room with guys like Abdullah the Butcher and Hufatud Guerrero. Um, you know, I got to meet people like Aki Bono and that. Um, so, yeah, man, it was, it was shit hot. As well as getting to be in there with uh, all the Dragon Gate guys as well. Like, I think it was in the, within a stint of about six weeks, I, like, went through the entire roster, like, in regards to matches. So Didn't you tag with Neville as well? Yeah, that was weird because Neville and uh, Oliver Gray became tag champs in NXT. So it was two of my tag partners <laughs> from different periods of my life, like, going on to be a successful team together. I guess they both saw both saw that I was just holding them back and <laughs> cut me loose and went on to bigger and better things. So, yeah. Is Japan something that you'd like to look forward to maybe in the future? Maybe. Like, the thing is, is that, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm, I love being lazy at home. So, like, <laughs> the fact that, you know, I can, uh, you know, at the moment I'm super fortunate that I get to spend a lot of time with uh, my kids and my wife. Um, that's something that, you know, like, um, I look forward to and motivates me and drives me. So, um, yeah, I mean, it would be great to go back to Japan. I mean, you know, who wouldn't want to go back there? I mean, it's awesome um, wrestlers out there and an awesome opportunity. But, you know, you never know. Like, right now, like, British wrestling is taking off. And the massive thing is that I never thought that British wrestling would be where it's at. I don't think anybody is, to be honest. No, and it's such a shock. And it's something that I want to make sure, you know, just continues to grow and blossom because it would be awesome if there was a bigger scene over here for guys to make full-time incomes. If that was an option, who would want to go abroad? True. Um, speaking of abroad, 2011, you were, uh, had a stint in TNA. No. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about bringing it up. <laughs> um, it didn't really end too well. It was horrendous. It was horrendous from start to finish. Um, and it's just one of those things that you look back on and you're like, I wish I was the person I am now back in that opportunity. But then had I not been through that process, I wouldn't be who I am today. Do you know what I mean? It was something where I took an opportunity to you know, try and make a name for myself. Um, I, you know, I felt like it was kind of almost hindered from the, the, the moment that it started in certain regards to, you know, character or gimmick or whatever, because I don't want to be a knockoff John Morrison, but at the same time, I'm like, if you're telling me this is what you want, this is what I'm going to give you. Hopefully after a few weeks, like, I can, you know what I mean, convince you it's not working and just say like, hey, let me, you know, rebrand as me and do this my way but uh it's like stone cold he went into the wwe as the ringmaster and exactly like, eventually changed his gimmick up and things skyrocket from there right so. like and what do you in regards as well like you're a 23 year old kid like do you know what i mean are you going to turn around and say to like the people running the second biggest wrestling <laughs> company in the world no your idea sucks let me like i know what i'm doing do you know what i mean it's like um that was something that i i didn't take choice wise back then but you know it was something that like I said like you learn a lot of things across the years it was something it was definitely a learning experience for me 
Um, and you know, it's something that you just have to look back at and laugh. <laughs> Even the injury. <laughs> oh no, no, that was quite depressing to be honest with you. But yeah, that wasn't fun. Can you tell us what happened. For those that yeah, so know. I botched a shooting star press and came directly down on my head, um, which caused a concussion. Um, and it was, yeah, it was such a weird moment because. Like, I, I remember briefly as the moment happened where I was kind of like freaking out in my head, like, what was that? And I calmed myself down. And then because I was on autopilot, I remember William reading uh, William Regal's book from years ago where he was saying that he could just rest on autopilot. And in that moment, I was like, I'm just like William Regal. And that was my initial thought. And yeah, uh, things, things got yeah, a bit more sour after that. But yeah, it was fine. Do you think that injury kind of made you change your style of wrestling? I definitely stopped doing the shooting star press after that. I think I learned my lesson. Like the the depressing thing was is that I could used to be able to like rotate onto my back. Like in a training I could hit springboard shooting stars. I could just never um, you know, coordinate where it went and it was something that I hated doing but I knew that like I wanted to it was something that not everybody could do, so I'd therefore try and make myself do it because I wanted to, you know, make a name for myself at that time. Um, and sometimes it is it's kinda sad that people have to like do that to get ahead. Like, you know, um, and everybody's different in regards to wrestling. A lot of people are smarter and, you know, do take different routes and things that work for them. And that was just something that I guess I was trying at the time that to try and get me places. But, yeah. All about longevity and trying to make that. I know this now. I've learned. I've definitely <laughs> learned across the, the years. So, yeah. So, you come back to England, you start working at places like All Star, Southside, uh, back at IPW, NGW. Um, starting getting noticed a bit, getting a bit of a name for yourself. Um, progress come calling. Um, you're in a faction, I think, called Screwing Your Wrestling. Yeah. How did you enjoy that period and what was it like working as a heel? Um, Screw Indy started because Rampage Brown and I loved Ribbon Cruise <laughs> when we were on the road with him. Um, and yeah, we were just kind of like three, we were three guys who hung out all the time. And um, we came up with this brainchild being Screw Indy Wrestling which um, was another learning experience of mine across the years. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it was, it was interesting. It was fun, man. Like, you know, I've been here for, like, uh, many uh, parts of my career. And, yeah, that was definitely one of them where I think just the culmination of, like, just anger, frustration, and depression just culminated in me being a vile human being for Did a bit. you find it quite so, cathartic? I, yeah, I look back at, like, plenty of points in my life where I'm like, I just, if I could have those years back, then just forget about it like everything that went on that would be great but you live in there um, eventually screwing your wrestling um, for your performances you started getting really rave reviews from the fans at Progress you kind of you know by proxy turned your face um, 2016 pretty decent year for you um, not just in Progress you got to wrestle Kenny Omega yeah. what was that like he's arguably one of the best if not the best in the world right now. Yeah, I mean he's all right. Like he's okay. You know I mean? I've been in a ring with worse people, um, but that, I mean, it was cool, man. Like um, it's weird because I think the last time I saw Kenny before that was in 2009. So like I met him on one show many years ago, and then he went away to Japan and you know uh, blew up. Don't know for himself. Yeah, well, he, he's been okay. He's he's doing he's not doing too bad. And uh, yeah, so again, to step in the ring with somebody who's regarded as highly as Kenny is, is, is always awesome. And, uh, yeah, he's, he's a great talent. Um, Want to talk briefly on uh, Smash Wrestling in okay. Canada. Um, you won the title here at uh, the Electric Ballroom against Johnny Gargano. What was that like? Dude, that was insane. Um, yeah, because it was an open challenge, I don't think many people expected it to be me. So the reaction I got coming back and then reaction I got for winning was even more crazy than what like you know I could have anticipated uh, yeah definitely one of the you know um, highest points of my career uh, for sure and getting to go out to Canada as well was super awesome it was something I'd always wanted to do and um, getting to do that with Smash has been nothing but a dream come true um, yeah I love it out there you say that um, winning the Smash title was up there is one of the best moments of your career. Yeah. Would you say winning the Progress title at Brixton's 
slightly eclipsed it or I'd say it's definitely like the same on par with you know like it was something that I um, it's something I you know chased for so long uh, and it was a huge moment like the reaction I got from you know the fans losing their shit when um, the bow rang like I'm, I never expected that um, genuinely like you always go through these thoughts and in my head I was like oh they're just gonna boo the shit out of this like do you know what I mean and um, yeah so with the, when they uh, yeah when they um, cheered and uh, you know, it just went mental I was, yeah yeah it was awesome especially um, if you got someone like Tommy End in there as well who's like, highly popular the, the, the craziest thing fans. is that I've known both Marty and Tommy for years um, so it's been cool to see each other at the start of our careers and then like growing to the performers that we are and knowing that they're going off now around the world um, doing their things that was you know, super cool to be a part of you know, I guess one chapter of their lives closing in the next beginning um, yeah and like I said I'm the biggest show in progress history in front of that many people um, yeah that was a huge honor man it was a great moment Right, um, sorry to bring this up, obviously, sure. but uh, I want to talk about the injury that you sustained, which meant that you had to give up not only the progress title, but the uh, multitude of titles that you called at the time. I think yeah. it was the, did you have the uh, Southside Speed King? Uh, I think you were also Fight Nation champion, uh, the Smash champion. Smash champion, progress champion, and maybe that? No, and Iron Fist British. Heavyweight champion, which I still hold. That was the only bout that I didn't lose. Oh, they let you keep that yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, See, they they let me keep it. Nobody else did. But no. Um, obviously, it must have been absolutely heartbreaking, especially as you're at like the actual peak of yeah. your, your performances and like, it, what it with sucks. the WWE thing as well. That the timing probably couldn't have been much worse. Oh, it it totally sucks balls. Like it was. Um, it really did, but it was something that at the time, like, uh, like I didn't know the the extent of, like, um, so basically what it was, I had a, a MRI on my neck, which determined I've got, um, I think it's about four discs in the stage of early degeneration. I've got two bulging discs on separate levels. I've got a narrowing between um, two different sets of vertebrae on the left hand side causing irritation on a nerve which stems into my shoulder. Um, I've got a straight cervical spine, one of my um, uh, what you call it? One of my vertebrae is out of place which I didn't really explain like the extent of how bad it was um, and the difference of opinions that I got was speaking to the first physio was like your neck is fucked, you have the neck of an 80 year old, you need to think about retiring because one more bump and you could be paralysed. Right? The next physio I spoke to said, two weeks of rehab and you'll be fine. See you later. And the, um, the difference of an emotional roller coaster that you go on between the two, like I had no idea what was what was up, but I kept mind that like I was getting this tingling down my arm, like I'd woken up at certain points and I couldn't feel my hand because it was my entire arm was burning. Um, you know, I was getting headaches as I wrestled that were coming up from um, sort of like the back of my neck over the top of my head. Um, I thought I was just dehydrated, so I just like neck a ton of water before I went out, and I was getting bloated <laughs> and, and still had headaches. You know, and it was something that I didn't know the extent of, and I was like, I don't know, you know, anything spinal related. Like you've got to be cautious of, right? I was like, I would never forgive myself if I was in a match with somebody and I try to pick somebody up and say like suddenly the left side of my body gives out or like you end up dropping them on the head or something, and I paralyze that person. Like I could never forgive myself for doing that, and I was like. While this is obviously like a you know pretend this is a risk to me because I'm beat you know, beat the fuck at the moment. This could be a risk to somebody else, and this is something that I'm not gonna allow. So that's you know that was a driving force really for me to step away and just you know just take time away and just try and heal up, man. Like you know you get so beat up and you can get burnt out and worn up, like down after a while. And um, yeah, it, it sucked that that was the timing of it. Um, but. You know, it just sometimes you have to roll with the punches, especially if you want longevity. Sometimes it's better to take that time away so then you can come back and go for longer as much as it does. So. I mean, things are going all right now. Obviously, you've got uh, the uh, Lucha Forever Championship. Yeah, you're off to uh, Canada next month for uh-huh. the uh, match with Tyson Dukes for the Smash yeah. title. Got a tag title match today in progress. Right. So things are looking up. 
obviously you've got Bowler as well. Right. So um, next weekend I've got a match with Ryan Smile, Marty Skirtle for the OTT Championship. Um, so yeah, it's a lot, a lot of championships I'm going to be winning. That's good. Soon, so. See, got to get him back <laughs> in there. <isn't> <laughs> Um, I want to finish with a quick word association game. Okay. I'm going to say a name, and I just want you to say the first word or few words that come into your head. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Martin Stone. Uh, it always reminds me of like a Vinnie Jones kind of like gangster movie. Joel Redman. Uh, Joel. It's Joel, isn't it? <laughs> Nathan Cruz. Smelly, dirty, unprofessional, arsewipe of a human being. Nah, he's, he's alright, he's alright, mate. Rampage Brown. Uh, Rampers. I love Rampers. He's awesome. I wish he was on uh, more shows because, yeah, he's, he's incredible. Uh, Shah Samuels. Cartel. Cartel. I remember those days, Shah. Don't you forget. Neville slash Pack. Uh, Flippy. Marty Skirl. Dickhead. Tommy End slash <laughs> Alistair Black. Arsewipe. I don't know. No, I'm not going to be rude anymore. Um, no, uh, Illuminati kind of person that I don't fully understand, but I'm glad that other people do. Mandrews. Mandrews. He's a dude. Jimmy Havoc. Uh, I don't know. He's my mate, but we also keep fucking each other up, so bad times. IPW UK. Uh, I don't know. Um, international professional wrestling. <laughs> Rev Pro. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I would say Andy Crowden, but that doesn't really give like an answer because I think, hey, Rev Pro, Andy. But, it's yeah. the first thing that comes to your head. Um, <laughs> Smash wrestling. If we're talking first thing that comes to my head, I'm, now I'm just going Canada. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean, I'm just naming either the place or that who runs a promotion. That no, I love Canada. It's like my home. Progress. Plays at Arkle Hunt, isn't it, bro? Hi, how are you? Good, you? Good. How are you doing? Hi. Hi. Fight Club Pro. I love Fight Club. Fight Club was mental. You know it. That's why you got in late. Don't you try and make out that it's just travel. I saw you dancing on the bar. That was <laughs> <laughs> and uh, finally, Mark Haskins. Oh, wow. Wow. Learning curve. I'll go. <laughs> durable, maybe durable. It's good word. Or dysfunctional. One of one of many. Durably words. dysfunctional. <laughs> um, where do you see yourself in five years' time? Uh, hopefully still alive. You know. Um, Ambitious. Yeah, yeah. As long as I can not die for a while, I'll be I'll be very happy. So yeah, no. Um, I don't know. Probably older, more grizzled, and even hairier and hopefully not shorter but uh yeah i don't know i'll still be i'll be still be doing something i'm sure right nice one Mark. Uh, thank you very much for your time uh, thank you dude appreciate it